This is the Organic Association of Kentucky's virtual farm tour with Lazy Eight Stock Farm. Thank you for joining us today. We're just going to take a minute to make sure everyone gets in. We do have over 100 people registered for this online event, which is very exciting. It does take a minute for everyone to come into the webinar. So normally these events are in-person farmer field days and we're on a farm with each other and we love that. And we've adapted the format online in order to keep everyone safe while continuing to learn the season. So thank you for joining us. Please do use the chat function to submit any questions for Bryce today uh, and Mark, who will be on the call as well. Um, we'll answer them in the last five to 10 minutes during the Q&A of the event, but we might also respond to them during the conversation as well. Um, so please do use that chat bar um, to, to share your questions as we go. We are also streaming live to Facebook, so welcome to all of our friends there. Um, to those of you on Facebook, please place questions in the comments. Um, we're, get, we're monitoring those as well. Finally, we're recording the session and we'll make it available via email and its website after the event, so share it as you like. And um, we'll have a post-event survey for all your feedback. We really value your input on that. Okay. So let's get started. For those of you that don't know about Oak, um, we are um, a nonprofit organization that works to advance organic agriculture in Kentucky. We have programs that focus on farmer field days. Uh, we normally offer those throughout the year. This year we're doing a handful virtually. We also have organic transition trainers um, that come out and work on farms one-on-one -on -one with farmers to help them apply for organic certification. If that's of interest to you, please email me after this event and we'll get you started. We have an online um, organic farming conference this year. We're going virtual for 2021, so please save the date for that event, January 26th through 30th. Uh, and we also have a um, Kentucky Farm Share Coalition Workplace Wellness CSA program that Bryce Lazy Eight Stock Farm is one of our participating members in, so you'll hear more about that. Um, but that does offer a CSA to employers who are interested in connecting their their employees with healthy foods. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that offers membership. So many of you on the call today are members. Thank you for that membership. It, it's a great way to stay connected, get some membership benefits, um, and also to promote your farm through our online farm directory. So that's a little bit about us. These events are really only possible because of our sponsors. So we're incredibly grateful to Patagonia, Globetrotter Foundation, and Round Hill Farm for supporting farmer education through field days, um, transition trainer support, and conference. So thank you to those folks. And a huge thank you to Grow Appalachia for the partnership um, for this specific event um, and in all things farmer education. So now I'd like to introduce Mark Walden from Grow Appalachia to share a bit about their organization and the project. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, first, I want to say a big thank you to Brooke and Jenny and the rest of the Organic Association Kentucky crew for putting this um, virtual field day together. And obviously a thanks to Bryce and Lazy 8 Stock Farm. Um, I know that they're a busy crew out there and I appreciate you taking the time to, to educate some of the folks attending today. Um, again, I'm Mark Walden. I am with Grow Appalachia, which is a program of Berea College in Berea, Kentucky. Um, we have a lot of different programs. We are predominantly an organic program. So the supplies that we purchase for our participating sites are all uh, organic approved or OMRI listed products. Um, but we have a significant amount of technical support work we do, as well as a summer feeding program who have fed roughly 200,000, served 200,000 meals this year. Um, so it's a, it's a new world that we're operating in currently, um, but we're going to do our best to keep pushing forward and, and working in the region. Um, yeah, and so some of this funding that, that helped this project come together today is part of a USDA Beginning Farmer Education Series. Uh, we'll be signing up new participants on starting on August 5th, so uh, if you'll Hop over to Grappalachia on Facebook when you have time. You can follow us and you'll see that notification if you're interested in uh, participating in the program. 
And again, thanks, Brooke and the Oak Crew, and I will turn it back over to you. All right. Well, we love working with you all. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to connect with so many folks, especially virtually this time. Um, so I, before we dig into the specifics of Lazy Eight Stock Farm, I do want to share with you that during this virtual farm tour, um, Bryce will be discussing a lot of production techniques and considerations appropriate for USDA certified organic farming. Um, we'll make reference to the National Organic Program regulations. That's, um, those are highlighted in orange here. Um, we'll make reference to those throughout um, and we'll highlight which practices are related to those specific regulations. So there's a lot of detail. Um, so I'd like to point out a few resources here for your consideration for now and after the event. If you're interested, um, first, uh, if you're interested in pursuing organic certification, please contact me about working with an organic specialist. We help take the guesswork out of the process. We can help you with all the record keeping, the paperwork, the application, um, designing your farm maps. Um, so we were really here to, to provide that support for free to farmers who are interested in pursuing organic certification. Um, second, the second link there is for the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, the organic program. They are an accredited certifier for the organic program in Kentucky. Um, they are not the only one that does certification, but they do primary, they do certify from most, the majority of farming operations in Kentucky. Um, so please check out their website for the organic program and all the links to the forms required for organic certification are there. Um, and third, please note the organic, the National Organic Program at USDA. Um, they are the federal regulatory program that develops and enforces these national standards. Um, so for the complete listing of all of the regulations, <laughs> all 100 plus pages, uh, you can check them out at that link there. Um, but please bookmark these for use in the future. All right. With that, I'd like to introduce Bryce Bowen, a Lazy 8 Stock Farm with us today. We're just thrilled um, that you're able to join us and that you have shared so much with us in preparation for this. Um, so I'm going to hand it over and you can give us all the details. All right. Thanks, Brooke. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, you know, I guess I always, I, knew, I always knew I wanted to be a farmer. It started pretty early. And... Um, when I was five years old, I knew that I wanted to do it, but I didn't know how it was going to happen. And uh, started selling at the farmer's market when I was 12 years old, raising sweet corn. And then we grew, grew some tomatoes. And in high school, I had a, um, a you pick strawberry patch as an FFA project. Uh, and um, the farms just kind of changed and grown over the years. We started um, on my grandparents' farm. My parents did not farm full time, so this was something that was kind of new for us. Um, uh, I was able to use some of my grandparents' land to get started, and over the last um, 15 years, it's kind of grown into what it is now. Um, it's uh, uh, the farm right now is a little over 400 acres, uh, and we sell mainly through our CSA, so it's it's changed and it, it looks a lot different than a lot of farms in our area right now. Um, uh, you can see this is part of our uh, organic certification map. We have to map all of our fields and this just gives you a little bit of an overview of how the land lays. Um, the, the whole farm is made up of um, four different farms and we have to identify these so we can keep good records. And, and it's a pretty typical Central Kentucky farm. The land rolls. It's not the perfect vegetable farm by any means. Uh, our largest, you know, tillable fields about three acres. And we split, split those up into smaller blocks. So you can see in total, we've, we've got um, about 50 acres of tillable land if we, if we plowed everything that we felt comfortable plowing to kind of keep the erosion under control. So it takes uh, you know, 400 acres of land to get 50 acres of tillable land, just to give you an idea of, of uh, the lay of the land. Um, go to the next slide, Brooke, and um, you can see we've, we've uh, you know, irrigation is important for us. So fortunately, the farm is split in half by the Paint Lake Creek. So um, we, we can irrigate out of the, the creek. And we've also got some uh, city water on the farm. Uh, that we use when the creek dries up. We've got, uh, we grow all of our own transplants in the greenhouse and we've, we've built several high tunnels over the year. That's uh, kind of gets us started in the season and we've applied for some NRCS uh, high tunnel grants and received those. That's been a really good thing for us. And 
uh, participated in some NRCS irrigation projects and um, and we and we try to use the resources that are out there. There's a lot of uh, programs over the last several years that have really matched well with what we do. So I encourage everybody to look uh, at local USDA offices to see what's available out there and, and, and do things that, that line up with what you're already doing and kind of fit your operation. It, it's been a good thing for us. Yeah. I think we're going to uh, see a little video here about growing our own transplants. Um, so we use uh, organic potting soil. We just uh, use this pro mix, which we can buy locally. Uh, it's easy for us to get, so we don't have to plan too far in advance and think about it. It's um, just a lot of the uh, Amish and Mennonite uh, produce supply places keep it on hand. So we uh, buy it as we need it. Um, and we just mix it up in a, a mortar mixing pan because we're, we're never seeding tons of stuff. I mean, a big planting would be a hundred flats of something and that, that does take a little while to, to mix the soil up. And, and we're just um, mixing it to bust the, you know, it's a compressed bale so it comes in these clods and we just want to make sure it's good and loose. And we use uh, for trail starter fertilizer and and put some water in before we put it in the trays because this stuff is hydrophobic. So it's easier to uh, water the trays if they're wet to begin with. So like I said in the video, uh, getting started, one of the hard parts was just finding um, supplies to meet the NOP uh, regulations. And uh, we started out, you know, trying to buy uh, approved materials and mix our own potting mix. And, and now they're there are more options locally. So that's really helped in, uh, in getting started and writing your SOP for an organic plan and, and being able to do this uh, with a little bit more ease than, than we were when we first started. Um, also having your own greenhouse uh, really, really helps you kind of um, control your production and you're not dependent on going, someone else raising your plants. You, you can plant and have things ready when you need it. Um, and that really helps. Uh, soil fertility is a big consideration with organic stuff. And again, it comes down to availability of nutrients. We, um, you know, per our NOP regulations, we have to soil test and we do that uh, annually on not all of our fields, but on some of the fields just to check and see where we are. And, you know, it's always a balance of uh, amending the soil to the perfect balance and um, keeping it cost effective. Organic amendments are expensive. So we, we look for trends and improving over time versus uh, a fix in the moment. It's not gonna be the perfect balance of everything. We couldn't afford to do that, but you know, it's, it's the approach of all organic farming. It's, it's the long-term approach and making right choices and focusing on good growing good cover crops to create a living soil. Um, so, Along with the supplies, another big consideration are, you know, where do we get our inputs? Where do we get our seeds, our plant, plants, uh, potting mix? And we have to document all this stuff. So at first it was kind of daunting to do that, but now I've got spreadsheets and, and look for suppliers that carry organic seeds. Um, you know, our first option is to find varieties that perform well, that are certified organic and also perform well under organic conditions. It's amazing the difference that variety selection can make. Uh, you know, you don't want to go for the varieties that require lots of inputs, the high performance varieties, because we can't um, provide the nu nutrients that some of those crops demand. We want something that's kind of middle of the road that provides good quality, is dependable and provides some um, pest resistance. So sweet corn varieties that have a, a tight, uh, um, covering on them that the silks aren't too exposed so it keeps the bug out of them that that helps and um, and there's lots of resources for where to get those but we do have to document those and if we can't find certified organic seed we're allowed to use um, conventional untreated seed so raw seed or seed that has an organic approved coating and we document all that on a, uh, on a spreadsheet and then we don't have to recreate that every year. So we, we kind of find our varieties and, um, and keep that going from year to year and make changes. So for any, any seeds that are round, um, 
we use a vacuum seeder, which um, you just pour seed in here, and this is an aluminum plate that's got little holes drilled in, in it that that match up for uh, certain types of seed, and you can change these plates out. I've got a couple different size ones um, for like a 72 cell tray or a 128. Uh, we seed pelletized lettuce seed, onions, all the brassicas. Uh, it works really well, and you can seed a bunch of flats pretty quickly. Um, so. So if you're doing, you know, a greenhouse full of stuff, uh, it's definitely worth having one of these to to see. They're they're not cheap, but um, I like this one. It's got a table. It's better than those handheld ones that have a hose that hook up to a vacuum. Those are a little bit cheaper than this one, but but this one's nice if you're not fumbling around with um, lots of hoses and stuff that that I would trip over. Yeah, I think the vacuum seat is something that makes sense for folks if you're doing. 20, 30 trays of one variety and seeding, you know, 100 trays in a day. Uh, that makes sense and it helps you keep your schedule. Um, it speeds that up so much and then, you know, it's in February and March, you've got time to sit there and seed trays by hand. But when you're trying to make those plantings in June for the fall, uh, every minute counts. So we've really um, seen the benefit of of having a vacuum seeder. And and there are other options out there. You can find used tobacco seeders pretty cheap if you want to use the styrofoam trays, but you've got to make sure that your uh, seeder matches up with the type of tray that you use. The tobacco, the styrofoam tobacco trays are a different size than the, um, the 10, 20 trays that you would buy at uh, the vegetable supply houses. Um, so just make sure if you, if you get something used that it matches up with what you want to do. Um, I think we're going to talk about the germination mats here. So we germinate um, all of our uh, tomatoes and anything that needs extra heat like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, uh, melons, cucumbers, anything that really benefits from some intense heat in the soil on these electric uh, germination mats. Um, and they've, they've got their advantages and disadvantages versus a germination chamber. A lot of people use a germination chamber that keeps the humidity up. That's nice for uh, keeping the flats from drying out, but this way they always get sunlight. So we've got, I think they're 10 feet long and uh, we've got eight. Eight of those, they hold about um, five or six flats a piece. And each flat you can put 300 tomatoes in. Uh, to start the little bitty ones. And um, so we can start a lot of tomatoes on here and there's just a uh, just a little resistance mat on here that you plug in and I control four mats off of one controller and there's just a little temperature probe that we put in the soil and then you can adjust what the soil temperature is. So independent of air temperature, we can really um, dial that in to keep the you know, the peppers and tomatoes at 80 or 85 degrees soil temperature to get those up quick and, and they'll be up in just a couple days uh, on these heat mats. So that's nice and, and much more accurate than just seeding flats and putting them out in the greenhouse. These uh, seedless watermelons are a good uh, example of a crop that you would want to germinate on heat mats or in a germination chamber. Uh, this is our late planting of personal size seedless watermelons and the seed is super expensive. It was about $1,000 to buy the seed for these flats. So having uh, something that you can really make sure that you've got your germination temperature right is important. Okay, so to reiterate that again, it, it, it's pretty economical to buy these things. You can put them in the basement, put a uh, fluorescent light over them if you don't have a, a greenhouse to stick them in. It's, it's nice for the seedlings to not get leggy. So like I said, uh, the heat mats opposed to the germination chamber uh, give you a little bit more um, stability as far as that goes and, and less risk of, of having leggy seedlings, which no one wants. Um, so uh, a big part of, you know, matching our production to uh, the farm is looking at all the things that it takes to grow vegetables. The What can our land do? Uh, how much labor do we have available? And, and Where's the market on this stuff? And and it's all you know we learn every year to balance that, but we've tried to mix uh, wholesale and retail. Retail being 
some farmers market sales and uh, our uh, community support agriculture where we have members that sign up at the beginning of the year, uh, pay up front, and then we deliver vegetables to our businesses. There are retail markets and our wholesale market. We sell some of the grocery stores, uh, wholesale uh, produce distributors, and um, we work with uh, Appalachian Sustainable Development in Virginia, Appalachian Harvest to uh, to reach some of the larger organic wholesale markets. So it helps to have kind of a broker to get your foot in the door um, because the logistics of that with the audits and uh, maintaining the uh, wholesale relationships can be daunting for small farmers. So it's helped for kind of a third party uh, middle person to, to maintain those relationships. Yeah, one thing I should say about the, uh, the labor things, we, we, um, for two years now, have participated in the uh, H2A yes, visa program. So that's provided us with a stable seasonal workforce that kind of helps make When we think this. about field layout, uh, first off, we've tried to standardize everything as much as we can to eliminate as much thinking as possible from year to year. Uh, these are standard. Um, field blocks they're 500 feet long and they're eight beds and we've got six foot uh, beds center to center um, so it's about roughly 50 feet wide with a 12 foot driveway and the grass driveways provide multiple functions for us for one when it's raining it gives us a good base to drive on so we're not getting stuck in the field it also breaks the water from washing uh, across the field so we've got a good sod base here that's going to act as a buffer uh, to prevent erosion and catch any soil that may wash off of the, the block. It's really helped us focus our thinking and then not have to rethink from year to year about where everything's going to go. Uh, standardize everything. So we've tried to have 500 foot rows that are uh, consist of eight beds. So when we grow plants in the greenhouse, we know how many plants to grow. We know before we seed something in the greenhouse, we know where it's going to go in the field and we know what's going to be planted there next year. So that's all uh, helps with our crop rotations, with harvest, with knowing how, how much supplies to buy. Uh, it's, it's really helped us to standardize um, kind of our production layout and also plan for access to the field. So when, you know, we're picking sweet corn. We want to be able to drive through the field and, and not have to carry the produce so far. So we put drive rows after every eight beds so we can get a, a tractor down the row and um, get the produce out. And it's just over the years, it's helped us in, in more than one way to standardize all of our field blocks. And there's, um, and we also try to match those field blocks with what our production is. So just to help with planning. So we've worked pretty hard to figure out our crop rotations, and it's far from perfect. Um, when it began, uh, probably made the rotations a little too complex, and and just learning more about the farm and, and how the land lays and behaves. We've tried to group fields together that have similar soil types, similar drainage characteristics, and similar climate. Like we've got some fields on top of the hills that I know get uh, – have a little bit better protection from the frost in the spring and dry out sooner. And we group those fields together separate from the bottom land. And, um, and then we plant crops that do well in those fields and create rotate, kind of build rotations around what the land is and what crops do well there with a three year rotation. So it's not overly complex. Once we've got the rotation figured out, we don't have to rethink it. And we've sized our fields and beds um, that are appropriate for the size operation we have, how many customers we've got, how many wholesale contracts we've got, and, and then we're not trying to um, juggle too much or, or make it overly complex. In these bottom fields, kind of that I've got grouped between this field and one over there is uh, a late crop of tomatoes planted in these fields because the soil stays wetter, so it provides more moisture in the summertime. Uh, and those late crop, that late crop of tomatoes would go into the fall, probably wouldn't have time to get a good cover crop established. So the next spring, when we clean that field up, we would plant it to a brassica, and that brassica would end in July, 
and give us enough time to get a really good cover crop seeded early in the year that's going to provide for the crop of tomatoes in the third year. So cover crops were something that was really daunting and crop rotations to begin with. Um, and like I said, grouping those things together, not reinventing the wheel every year and knowing that um, what's going to be done in that field in the spring really helps with planning and stress level and knowing where to prioritize because, you know, there always feels like there's a million things to do. And if you can be confident that what you're doing is what you need to be doing, it, it helps, helps you make it through the year. Um, cultivation equipment is one of the biggest things that you need to consider on an organic farm. You know, everybody, everybody knows weeds grow really well and it's something that we struggle with. I mean, I, I don't know anybody that doesn't struggle with how to cultivate well and I'm still, I learn something every year. It doesn't seem like you can have enough tools um, to match the different conditions and I've tried to buy cheaper equipment, buy older equipment, stuff that's too big for small farms, but too small for big farms. And there's a lot of junk out there that works really great uh, for, you know, making vegetable cultivators out of. So you can see a couple of cultivators on the screen. I didn't pay $200 for either one of those. And then if you end up putting it on the scrap pile, you don't feel too bad about it, or you've got extra parts to fix other things. And um, having a grinder with a cutoff wheel and a cutting torch and a welder goes a long way in a diversified vegetable farm. So being able to adapt things and, and make it work for you really helps a lot. And it keeps your overhead low and keeps you from being tied to one um, type of production. Um, so it gives you just some flexibility and keeps the stress down, except when it breaks. So we're in a field of lettuce that we've been harvesting on quite some time. We're in the final final beds. We laid all this plastic in uh, the middle of March and it's late June now. Uh, we had some wet weather this spring so the nice thing about having your plastic laid and ready to go is you can keep your planting schedule and with something like lettuce it's really important to you know plant every week or every other week uh, so you've consistently got something to harvest. Um, the other thing that's really nice about this is it stays clean. Uh, you know, we've, we've not cultivated anything. We've had quite a bit of rain and you can still come in and cut the lettuce and it's clean on the bottom. So we cut early in the morning, uh, come out in the field, put this in bins so that the milk doesn't get on the other heads of lettuce, put it straight into the cooler and uh, then straight into CSA without washing. So we're growing wholesale lettuce um, and also trying to have it every week for CSA. Uh, it's one of those crops that's hard to be super consistent with to keep it so you've got something that's ready to harvest each week. Ready to harvest. The way that we've been able to do that is by using plastic mulch. Uh, we start the season with black plastic mulch and when it starts to warm up kind of after those first four or five plantings we switch to white plastic to keep the soil cooler. This is kind of a late summer field of lettuce. Uh, we planted eight rows. Uh, we use five foot wide plastic on a flat bed layer. So you've got almost four feet of plantable space on top of the bed. And we plant four rows of lettuce and those are 500 foot rows. So uh, each bed will hold about 2000 heads of lettuce. Yeah, lettuce is a good example. Um, picking these wholesale crops, you know, we, we try to pick crops that we can consistently grow well to uh, that's that's the thing about a wholesale market is you've got to be consistent. You got to have consistent quality and consistent production, and try to avoid peaks because the peaks are hard to get rid of. Um, it's all about where you're going to sell the stuff. So developing those steady markets is really important in a vegetable operation because that um, that provides you with a little bit of stability and and not having to rework or try to find a new market in the middle of the summer. That that makes it tough, um, and and we grow things like tomatoes, uh, bell peppers would be a good one, uh, crops that grow well in Kentucky, and, and here's some tomatoes uh, that we also grow for wholesale. A uh, crop of heirloom tomatoes that we have trellised out here, we do the Florida weave method. These have uh, five or six twines on them. Uh, these are ready to be tied up again, but we, we raise the heirlooms on T-post uh, because they're an indeterminate vine and 
will continue to grow all the way to the top and then fall back down to the ground if they don't get any disease problems. Uh, they're on plastic with drip tape under the plastic and we mow the uh, walkways with a flail mower and those are just the weeds that come up between the rows. We don't sow anything. Uh, we got plenty of seed already in the ground so we just keep that clean. Yeah, toma tomatoes are um, a tough thing. I, I see a couple questions here about um, planting. Uh, we, we use a water wheel setter to plant all the crops that we grow on plastic and something like tomatoes where we're planting every 18 inches. We've got two people that ride on the planter or setter and, uh, and plant those while they're riding. The lettuce we plant uh, pretty intense planting uh, every 11 inches. It's 11 by 11 inch spacing on those plants. Um, and we just poke the holes with the water wheel setter and then uh, plant it all by hand. Uh, get a crew of folks out there uh, three or four people and and just go to town um, so the the hole is made with the machine it's watered and then we just run along and stick the plants in and um, and you know we don't have to buy a different piece of equipment uh, it keeps it simple and it takes a little bit of time but you know if it's too wet uh, we can pre if we see rain coming we can pre-punch the holes and and then go in there and, and just do it by hand and it it really doesn't take that long um, uh, also, something with lettuce, you know, deer can be a problem. We use a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of temporary electric fencing that we've used for cattle uh, and little solar fence chargers. And we'll just put a double uh, kind of an offset wire around the, um, the lettuce fields. Uh, they don't bother it too much when it's small, when it gets a little bit larger. As soon as I see somebody's uh, tested a couple heads of lettuce out, I'll, I'll go put the fence out around it and can do that in 30 minutes doesn't take too long and, and does a really good job of keeping the, um, the deer out. Some things like raccoons are harder, but um, we, we try to find a way and electric fence is a good, a good way to do that. Um, here we are in a crop of potatoes for CSA. Yeah, we've got a, a crop of potatoes. We grow about an acre of potatoes for our CSA. We don't really wholesale any, but we try to have enough that we can keep the CSA full for the season. Um, we made a little homemade planter, so we cut the potatoes just with a with a knife, nothing fancy. Uh, it took about 2,500 pounds of seed to plant plant an acre, and I don't really know if that's good or bad. Uh, that's just what we ended up with. Um, uh, and, and they've done really well this year. Uh, I bought an old buffalo cultivator and put some big sweeps on it to hill these. We started out with uh, blind cultivation. We cultivated them one time and they got really cold and burned them to a crisp. Uh, there was nothing green left. And uh, so I didn't feel bad about cultivating them pretty aggressively after that frost. Uh, it ran through twice with the blind cultivator. And one time with just like a springtime uh, Danish sign cultivator and uh, and then hilled them and, and they've done really well. We pulled the weeds out of them one time by hand, kind of walked the field over and um, have had good luck with them. Potatoes are hit or miss for us, but it's been a good year. Yeah, I was just talking with someone about potatoes today. It seems like a lot of our nightshade crops do really well on higher ground. Um, the tomatoes that I mentioned earlier that we planted in the bottom have uh, had some disease in them. The bottoms do stay wetter. Uh, there's more humidity in the bottom, the fog settles in the morning, there's less airflow. So having our nightshade crops, including potatoes and tomatoes, peppers, any of that stuff on higher ground that we can irrigate, uh, it really makes all the difference. Um, so, you know, again, for us, the, the farm has a lot of different uh, types of ground on it, and it's good to choose higher ground for those nightshade crops. Uh, this is a uh crop of heirloom beans. These are NT half runners. Um, we raise these for our CSA, but also we raise our own seed. So we've isolated this field. It's just kind of a small field off by itself. Uh, so they're not gonna cross pollinate with anything. Um, the rows are about 150 foot long and these beans are uh, roughly three weeks old. Um, they're you know, we, we prep our ground just like uh, we would for any other crop, uh, plow disc and run a power harrow. We use our uh, 
seeder to direct seed these beans. Uh, we've got a, a Mattermack vacuum seeder, but um, you could use anything like an Earthway push seeder or something. They, beans plant pretty easy, so uh, you don't need anything fancy for that. Uh, we plant a row every six feet, so it's the center of the bed. And once the beans are up and we've cultivated them with the tractor one time, we'll uh, go ahead and drive a uh, seven foot T-post and we use just an earth anchor and I think it's um, 5 sixteenths cable. Uh, and we used to tie the cable to the post, but finally we just thought, well, we'll just drill a hole. So we just, uh, on a drill press, drilled a hole in the, in the T-post. Sometimes they'll already have a hole in the top uh, when you buy them and then drill a hole in the bottom and run the cable through there. Uh, we also use a, a gripple uh, fence strainer. We used to use those high tensile uh, twist strainers, but you can really use just kind of whatever whatever works. Um, we put a quick coupler on here. That's a threaded. I think a threaded half link is the or a threaded link is the uh, right term for it. But it comes apart, so you can just take it off of there and not have to redo this each year. It's got a cable clamp on there, and it'll hold quite a bit of weight. Um, you know when the vines grow up and the wind blows you do have quite a bit of weight on them so we run our strings on the cables and just use the I think it's like an eight pound box of tomato tie twine duct taped to a board we drill holes where the twine comes out we tie it off and then we just pass this board it takes two people one person hands it over and then the other person hands it under and um, you can do a whole row and in about 10 minutes doesn't take too long to run the strings on it once you've got the cables up. So it is a lot of work, but uh, it's a great way to grow beans and it's a good trellis. And the strings, when you do four at a time, don't blow and bunch up in the wind. They kind of push against each other. So it'll keep the spacing throughout the season. And once we're picking on these beans, as long as they've got enough moisture, we can harvest them for four weeks. Beans, as I'm sure many of you know, can be tough. Uh, we had some hot weather and, and that crop of beans right there, the, until about waist high, the, you know, got pretty hot and dry there for a little bit. And the, um, the blooms all fell off, but they look really good from waist high on up, which makes for good picking. So we don't have to pick all the low beans. They fell off and, uh, we'll just be standing up picking beans. Um, here's some cabbage for, uh, CSA. We're in a field of cabbage, and this is entirely for CSA. Um, and we grow, there's probably four or five different kinds of cabbage in here and a few kohlrabi. Uh, we group all of our brassicas together that have similar number of growth days. We transplanted this field, uh, raised our own transplants. It was uh, transplanted late March. Uh, it's late June right now. And we're, we're in harvest. Um, We've got some mini cabbages in here and some bigger cabbages over there, but this field's been cultivated um, probably four times. Uh, we start about a week after the uh, transplants uh, go in the ground with a tine weeder to get the little weeds. And then we switch to a kind of like a rigid shank cultivator that we'll do a couple passes with. And then we've got a little bit more aggressive cultivator and we've still got weeds. Um, it seems inevitable. Uh, that we're always going to have Johnson grass and other things. And this field's close to harvest, so we've intentionally not come in here uh, just so we're not uh, getting too much soil down in the um, in the plant, which would make it dirty. So we try to harvest clean crops. And um, so the weeds that are in here are not going to affect the quality of the crop right now. Sometimes if we plant this in the bottom, we're going to start raising it on uh, plastic mulch uh, for similar reason. Just to keep the moisture in the ground, but also to keep the, the crop as clean as possible because these head crops, if they if they get too much dirt down in the bottom of them, they just get kind of icky looking and uh, require more work in the packing shed. So we want to harvest stuff that's as clean as possible to eliminate as much labor as possible in the packing shed. So the, the brassica crops, um, again, it's a uh, Growing brassicas in Kentucky can be a challenge in the spring uh, because it um, it can get so hot in May. So having irrigation for those crops is pretty important. 
And, and that's what I think, you know, we always are conscientious of how much plastic we use, but uh, nothing feels worse than not having something to put in CSA. It's just terrible when that happens. So um, all the conventional farms, all the organic stuff in the stores, uh, they use plastic mulch and, um, you know, we, we are conscientious in how we use that, but for some things there's just, uh, with as much humidity as we've got and the need for consistency, uh, for, to maintain this, um, higher value market, we just, um, don't see any other way around it kind of at the scale that we're at right now. Um, so it's, it's, uh, not without its challenges, but, uh, the coal crops provide a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of diversity in the types of coal crops you can grow. So it, it's, it's nice to have a, um, a couple different ways to raise those. Uh, we do grow some uh, wholesale kale uh, in the spring and the fall. It's hard in the summertime. And here's some, an example of some red Russian kale we've got. We're in a, a field of red Russian kale. We're growing for wholesale. Uh, you know, the thing about a wholesale crop is you got to grow it quick and you got to have a good yield and you got to keep the bugs off of it so that the uh, crop quality is high and can last on the shelf in the grocery store. Uh, we, um, you know, the big concern with kale or any brassica is a cabbage moth. So we use uh, spray this. We have an offset boom sprayer that we pull with the tractor that can spray four rows at a time. And uh, we have a dry powder uh, BT that we mix in the water and it's just a dry flowable and the sprayer mixes it up and it's a bacteria we spray to disrupt the digestive tract of the uh, the worms that eat the, the kale. One example of this is uh, I did a uh, an equip um, conservation activity plan for integrative pest management through NRCS. If you're not familiar with that, that's that's a good way to get some on-farm help and some really specific recommendations for what you're trying to do and to have the confidence that someone that knows a little bit more about the topic than you do can help you figure out the best way forward. So that's, that's something we've participated in that's helped us a lot. Um, and then kind of come putting that in your uh, organic SOP and looking at that document. So when you have an issue, go back and look at your SOP and say, what, what did I think I was going to do is a, uh, is a good way to, to stay on the pest management and for wholesale crops you've always got to start sooner than you think so once you see a problem it's many times it's too late to fix that problem especially in an organic system so you know preparing for disaster being you know two or three steps ahead of where ahead of where you think you need to be is is important so that you've got a really integrative approach and um and you're not you're proactive and not reactive uh it'll save a lot of heartache our high tunnels have been really integral to uh, kind of our shoulder seasons in the spring and the fall. Having, you know, everyone wants the first tomatoes uh, that come in and the high tunnels have been a great way to um, ensure that we can meet those early markets. Uh, these are unheated high tunnels. Um, we've got several of them on the farm and there's lots of resources about producing in high tunnels and if I had enough high tunnels, I wouldn't even raise tomatoes in, in the field anymore. It's just amazing how well they do in the high tunnels. Um, you can see in the photo there uh, where the tomatoes are growing. We, in, in one picking, we had four rows of tomatoes in there and picked 2,000 pounds in one day off of those four rows of tomatoes. So it's just, it's just amazing what you can do in a high tunnel and um, would recommend them. It's they're management intensive, uh, labor intensive, but the yields can be really phenomenal. A big thing of um, the wholesale crops, when you start taking less money, you're not getting retail price, you're getting wholesale price that's gonna be marked up sometimes three times before it gets to the shelf in the grocery store. You've gotta be efficient. So we, you know, like I said earlier, we try to harvest crops in the field that are clean, uh, graded in the field so we're not carrying too much stuff around and, and ready to just go either on the pallet or in the CSA boxes when they come back to the packing shed. So we actually sold our produce washer. We, you know, there's some things that we could use it for, but it was taking up more room and, and it's easier for us just to, to keep the space open, to focus on keeping the crops clean when they come out of the field and, and growing quality produce. So we're not having to grade and, and um, cull too much. 
And this is something we've offered now for a couple of years, uh, which is a customized CSA. Many people, you know, we started CSA, we had a standard box. All of our members each week would get the same box. And um, that was great from a management perspective in some ways that you didn't have to think about too many different pieces. You just knew that you were going to do the same thing over and over. But from a customer's perspective, that's not the best thing. Uh, not everybody likes kohlrabi. Uh, some people hate beets. Some people love beets. And um, kind of we joined the trend when it first started happening of doing a custom packed CSA box. So meaning that each customer orders uh, from the list of available produce and we pack those shares independent of each other. So each one is different. What that's allowed for us is to take advantage of when we have crops. Uh, say we've got 50 bunches of dill, but we don't have enough for the whole membership. It still lets us put those crops in the CSA and gives diversity for the customers and, and provides a better product. And once we've figured out how to make that happen, there's no going back. It's, it's really a great thing. We do a custom pack CSA, meaning that the customers can choose what they want in their box each week from what we've got available. We use Harvey to manage that for us. So we upload our inventory uh, for each CSA delivery and customers select what they want. And then we get a pick list um, that comes to us and it tells us everything we need to harvest and how much of it. And um, so we just make sure we check off as we go into the field and make sure we've got that. And then this pick list lines up with how it's packed in the box. So the heavier items come first and they would go in the bottom of the bag. Uh, so you're not crushing, putting a head of cabbage on top of your basil. Uh, basil would be at the end. So for each customer's box, there's a uh, list of what's in their share. So that lines up with how the boxes, how the line is set up and um, our role of labels is how the truck needs to be loaded. So we um, stack the line with the quantities that need to go in the boxes. People can choose, there's a standard unit, which would be like a head of cabbage or a pound of cucumbers um, or a pound of squash or a bag of something. And they're always set up in the units that they would go into the, into the boxes. So customization, again, it's just been a, a great thing for, um, for our customers and also for us to offer more diversity, to have less waste, uh, so we're not um, having to throw out as much stuff. And, and then over time, we learn what customers want so we can kind of tailor our production to the items that are popular and, and give us some predictability with uh, some data to back that up. Again, we've, we've participated in a lot of USDA pro programs that have really benefited the farm. And again, I would stress choosing programs that line up with what your goals are so that you're not creating um, unnecessary work or work that's not going to really benefit your operation. Uh, we knew uh, heat in a greenhouse is a big expense. Um, we had some ideas. We've got a lot of um, grown-up fence lines on the farm that you know, always have trees, so falling down that we need to clean up. And using that wood to heat our greenhouse was a good thing. We uh, did a GOAP on-farm energy grant and a USDA Rural Development uh, REAP grant, which is Rural Energy of America program, to, to build this um, hydronically heated greenhouse to grow our plants in. Um, so I, I can give more, if people can reach out to me if they want to learn more about that, but we use a, a wood stove to heat water. Uh, we've got on-farm solar um, to provide electricity for cooling. Uh, we use quite a bit of electricity uh, with, you know, we've got two walk-in coolers. One's pretty good sized um, walk-in and then just various other uses. So we, we try to be conscientious about our impact and um you know of, of everything that we do and all the energy that's required to grow food so fortunately this year we were able to um, install a solar array that offsets all of our farm electrical usage and we um, also got a, uh, a usda rural energy uh, for america program grant and some 
uh, money from the governor's office of ag policy the on-farm energy program which has been a really good thing for us um, so it'll end up paying for about 75 percent of the cost of this array and Mason worked with us through the application process and um, and helped with the design on some stuff so it's been just a, a great success i think to really offset all of our energy use yep so the the it helped um that i could do the project on my own i installed the stuff and um and it's it's been really great to see that meter spinning backwards uh building credits um to offset our electrical use and thanks for joining all right um bryce thank you so much for sharing so many details in such a very short amount of time <laughs> um, and we're just so grateful for your time and for all your time on the farm when we shot all of those beautiful videos. So um, thanks for all you do to grow incredible food and share the resources with all the farmers out there. Um, before we get into the q and I just want to recognize we are running just a little bit over. We do have a few questions that have been submitted, so we are going to get to those. Um, for those of you who need to log off right at three o'clock sharp, please take a minute to fill out the survey. The link is in this in the side chat bar there. Also, please feel free to reach out to our panelists, uh, to Bryce and to Mark at any time with questions. Um, their contact information is here. Um, reach out to me if you're interested in organic transition support. Um, and please take note of some organic resources that are great incredible resources online, um, PDFs, um, they also have print versions. Um, this, these are all hyperlinks, so when we send this out as a PDF after the event, um, you can just click on those links and, and get all the content there. All right, um, so we have Bryce and Mark on the um, screen share here, um, and we've had a few questions submitted throughout. Um, Bryce, there was a question early on um, about your irrigation. So how are you actually drawing water out of the creek and sort of talk to us about the, the mechanics of that, but also the flow and how much water you're moving, where if you're storing any on the on the land otherwise. Yep, yep. Um, so we just go to the holes on the creek. We've got, um, I guess we started not using creek water. We started just using mun municipal water. It was easier. We didn't have to buy a pump. It helped us with our organic regulations we didn't have to do water testing because we could just you know the gap stuff it can be confusing so it was easier to use start with municipal water first so we've got some piping for that on the farm um once those water bills got so high i didn't want to keep paying them um we looked for other options and we just bought one of the pumps from the produce supply houses it's got a suction hose a hon like a five horse honda motor on it uh, a strainer and a suction hose and a disc filter and I put that on a just a little cheap uh, harbor freight trailer so I can move it around the farm to different fields and we use um, like uh, quick couplers they're just sprayer fittings you can buy those same place and uh, blue lay flat and then drip tape under the plastic so it's a pretty simple system we've got um, different kinds of pressure regulators and filters and screens and valves and things that um, are complicated, but really all you need to do is just monitor the pressure, squeeze the blue pot to make sure that you've got enough water flowing through and then check the ends of the drip lines to make sure you've got water coming out. And if you put too much pressure on it, you'll figure it out the easy way. Um, but don't, op don't overcomplicate it, it's simple. Just get water out there. Uh, and that's one thing that I've, um, you know, you pay attention to nutrients, but having enough water is so important to grow vegetable crops. Uh, it's something I didn't realize at the beginning, but but water is as important as fertility to grow successful vegetable crops. It's not a row crop, it's not grain, it's not corn, and it's not tobacco. It's lettuce, and it takes a lot more water to grow some of these crops than it does traditional field crops. And and you just you know I learned the hard way, and um, would stress just the importance of good irrigation. There's a question here about the twine that you use and the bean trellising. Is that a natural fiber or synthetic fiber? Maybe what source just, you get it? It's just that standard tomato tie twine. We just buy bales of it and we use it because it's easy. And we've tried using um, 
you know, sisal or natural twine. And for something like the beans, it, uh, the wind blowing on it, you build all that trellis and then the sisal twine breaks before the beans get up to the top. And that's pretty disappointing. So again, it's not, it's not a ton of, uh, synthetic stuff in the broad scheme of things, you know, it's, um, and it's easy to get and it's cheaper and, um, and it works for us. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, there's, you know, some, we've thought about cotton twine and sisal twine and jute and all these things, but that tomato tie twine is just easy. Mark, I see that you had a response here about um, other considerations if someone wanted to limit the use of plastic on the farm in a smaller scale operation. You want to expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, so the, the ag plastic that uh, the larger producers are using are, are generally are a one season um, and sometimes one crop plastic. Um, so that, that'll have to be removed each year. And that's the same for any plastic in organic production. You're required to remove that from the field. Um, each year that you use it. Um, but at a smaller scale, you could consider um, using landscape fabric. Um, it is still a plastic material, um, but you can use it for multiple years, multiple seasons. And if you pre-burn uh, the holes in that fabric, you can, uh, you, you can utilize that fabric spacing uh, for the, a similar crop the following year. Um, there's also the option of using a, a clean straw mulch um, and clean being key. Uh, so you'll want to ask, um, if you can ask the producer of the straw whether or not they use any herbicides in their production, um, it's critical for you to, to know that, especially the broadleaf specific herbicides because they can remain in that straw for multiple seasons. Um, but that is, that is a good option. It's a natural mulch, and it does degrade over time. Um, and there's some no-till options for much smaller scale where um, you can either do a roller crimp of a, a standing cover crop to plant into or use a tarping system where you can terminate that cover crop and use the cover crop biomass as a mulch. Um, again, it's a real challenge at larger scale. Uh, and, and generally it's not economical, economically feasible at that greater scale. Thank you. Um, we're just a couple minutes over and I have two more questions. Um, one, Bryce, um, thinking about for, how do you manage fertility in your high tunnels? Um, I think the, the bigger challenge is having too much fertility because you don't get rain to wash the nutrients out. So you know, I was, we don't use a ton of fertilizer and when I soil test in there, it's just off the charts. I mean, it was maximum across the board uh, with fertility. So it's amazing when you don't have rain, how much fertility stays in the soil. So we didn't put anything. We, we grew that crop of tomatoes this year and added zero. Any, we didn't put anything. We planted them and watered them and it, they were phenomenal. So... <laughs> Um, and um, there's a final question here. Um, what are the barriers to entry for organic farming? Um, wondering if either of you would like to respond to those, that question. I think the biggest barrier is knowledge, markets, developing market. I mean, if you're talking about organic farming as a whole or vegetable farming, there's two different things. Um, Organic farming has got all kinds of challenges and it's production related and also finding a market. And that's the hardest thing for any small scale producer is finding a market, um, organic or not. Outside of that, you know, there's a huge learning curve to grow organic and there's a lot of failures and the economic stress of failure in an emerging business is real. So, you know, that's tough. And there's, you know, no programs to help offset that risk. You bear the, the entire risk of choosing to be an organic producer and the, um, you know, the risk management systems that are created by USDA aren't set up. There's not enough data in the county, you know, many times it's the first producer in the county. So there's no yield data. There's no risk management help. There's no crop insurance and there's no market. So there's a lot of barriers, <laughs> but there's good opportunities too. 
So, I, I mean, the way that I see it is that it, um, as a small scale producer, it provide you need to add as much value to your production as possible because you're never going to make up for it with volume. So that's a value added product and you're adding a lot of value being able to market it as organic and you have to find markets that will um, pay for that value that you create through organics. So with challenges, there's lots of opportunities too. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll reiterate that uh, Oaks transition trainers are organic specialists and they can help with that application process and the development of all of your record keeping systems, the templates, everything um, to help make that initial application and reapplication each year successful. Um, I will also highlight that in Kentucky, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture is the predominant certifier for farming operations and it's one of the cheapest certifiers nationally. So it costs $250 to certify your crop, um, any, all of the cropland or a portion of the cropland on your farming operation. Um, and you can get 75% of, of that back through the federal cost share program. Um, so it, it, there's not necessarily a financial barrier to actually getting that certification. Um, but as Bryce mentioned, there are plenty of, of challenges with the production side and the market access side. Um, but again, Oak is here to help with those as well, um, with farmer education and uh, market connections. So keep that in mind as well. Um, all right, we are six minutes over. So um, any final words, um, Bryce or Mark? Thanks. Yeah, well, thank, thank you so thanks much. Thanks for joining us, yeah. Thanks for joining us. Um, many thanks for being with us. And uh, please take a look at that survey and give us all the feedback. Uh, we love doing these. Um, so we, we'd be happy to produce more content that's appropriate for what your needs are. So just let us know in that survey. Um, and keep an eye out for our newsletter and upcoming events. And please save the date for our Oak Conference, January 26th through 30th, 2021. It'll be online. Um, all right, be well, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.